day that passes threatens the survival of our republic, and that is why we presented the path to prosperity, Madam Speaker, as a solution. Madam Speaker, I thank you for providing me the time today to talk a little bit about this budget. I hope folks will go to the web and learn for themselves the truth of the challenges facing this country. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gomert, for 30 minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's always a pleasure to get to address the House in your presence. And I tell you what, uh, there was quite an election in November of 2010. One of the results was a freshman named Rob Woodall from Georgia. And the gentleman from Georgia does his constituents proud. It's a pleasure to serve with him. His comments most meaningful. When we think of what is going on today in the world of energy, in the world of constitutional rights, in the world of religious freedom, there are things to be excited about and there are things to be greatly saddened about. When I came to Congress as a freshman, was sworn in in January of 2005, it looked like our days of being an energy giant in the world were over. Sure, we were the kings of technology, but we were hearing from people that use natural gas for most of the stuff, it seems like uh, you look around in a room and see whether it's plastics or uh, if you got food, probably had fertilizer, natural gas used to make the fertilizer. I mean, it, it, it has had such a role in so many things. In recent uh, months, I'd asked some scientists, do you see anything on the horizon that might replace natural gas as uh, for the uses as a feedstock to, for so many things we make, manufacture in this country. I was told not for at least 30 years or so. The amazing thing, though, in the last seven years that should have everybody in America excited is all the energy that's been found in America. Here we are having to all wring our hands, lower our heads, Oh, woe is us, gas prices going up. We got a president, unfortunately, seemed like a nice fellow, but he doesn't know anything about energy other than what's handed to him that he can read about. I wish that it were otherwise, but the fact is he keeps making statements that are not borne out by the facts with regard to energy. I've been excited as a member of Natural Resources Committee to find out all the things that are being found. In East Texas where I am, we're fortunate because there is a natural gas formation that Louisiana was kind enough to, to share with us. It goes, it's called the Haynesville Shale. For that reason, there's more natural gas being produced in East Texas than any of the other 31 congressional districts in America. Uh, there's the Marcellus Shale, Pennsylvania, runs up uh, into New York State, but a massive uh, natural gas formation. And the ability of hydraulic fracking, which has never been shown by a single scientific study to uh, pollute water, despite some of the stories, once they're investigated, people find out they're just simply not true. Because the whole purpose of hydraulic fracking is to push uh, oil or natural gas out of the formation and up. 
there is a vested interest in making sure that everything is sealed thousands of feet below where drinking water would be found. There is no scientific study that finds hydraulic fracking has uh, polluted drinking water. And yet you look at the things it's done, we now, depending on who you believe, we probably have at least 300 years of natural gas, even at an accelerated rate. People are now looking at having their cars running on natural gas. Then just when we think, well, natural gas is, is the thing of the future, now we've got 300 years in which to find a suitable alternative without bankrupting the country, trying to create something uh, in the way of solar power or wind power that one day, uh, solar power I think one day will be a very viable uh, source. But in the meantime, this president uh, in, in supporting his cronies who are manufacturing solar panels, some of them not doing anything but uh, enriching themselves, but, but uh, the market will take care of these things. When it is economically feasible and economically viable, then we'll see uh, things like solar uh, power become a reality. But it's no time soon. In the meantime, the president's friends are being enriched. The country is being taken to the poorhouse on a fast track. There's no need for that. Natural gas is, is, is the cleanest burning form of energy we could hope for. We're the largest uh, repository of coal in the world. And then we find all of this oil, this huge play in North Dakota. I've met with a third group now who tells me that in Utah, this hard reddish brown rock that you wouldn't think has oil, when, when uh, put under intense heat without oxygen, you get oil. They say it's $60 a barrel, they can make $10 or more a barrel. And they're doing it right now in Estonia, the same kind of rock, same kind of thing. And now the third group has told me they believe there's probably three, tra they think you could get three trillion barrels of oil from just one area of Utah. Then it goes into northwest Colorado and uh, southwest uh, Wyoming, from what we're told. We know that there have been enough wells drilled in the Middle East that all the oil that's there, we pretty well know uh, where it is. Have a good idea from the way the wells and the, the fields are being depleted about how much is left. Information that uh, I've been given indicated that there probably is somewhere around a trillion barrels of oil left in the Middle East. A trillion. And yet in one area of Utah, we're told there may be three times that much. Sadly, however, this administration does what it has done repeatedly for over three years. They put more and more of our resources off limits. So when the president reads the teleprompter that says, you know, there's just nothing I can do, to change the price of gasoline, would that we could get information to him to show him how wrong that is. There's oil, there's natural gas, there's coal. We've also been given information that when gasoline hits $4 a gallon, normally at least 25% to a third or so is purely speculation. So I, I realize the president wouldn't say there's nothing he can do about the skyrocketing price of gasoline. He, he surely means that, or I'm sure he wouldn't say it. When the truth is, if the president were to go on television tonight and announce that, you know what, folks, my uh, Secretary of the Interior in January of 2009, immediately on coming into office announced that he was sending back the checks 
for leases in this small area, may have involved some in northwest Colorado, but certainly Utah, uh, he sent back the checks and said, we're not going to allow leases on these areas that were let at the midnight hour by the Bush administration. Well, we'll give him the benefit of doubts that, and just say apparently he didn't know at the time what he was saying was not true. Those leases, as he admitted in one of our hearings, as I had to keep pushing to get the answer, were part of a seven-year process. Companies can't just come in and bid massive amounts of money on a lease that they expect to produce oil or gas until they've had a chance to study the information. It was a seven-year process, not midnight hour, seven years, and Secretary Salazar finally admitted, admitted that. Seven years just to get to the point where people could bid on those leases. Massive amount of federal land. The majority of Utah is federal land. And he put it off limits. Returned the checks after a seven-year process was completed. Well, fortunately, during the prior seven, eight years of the Bush administration, there were other areas where leases were let and permits were granted and drilling commenced. And I don't think we ought to be allowing anybody to drill that had as many safety violations as, as British Petroleum did in the Gulf. If you can't have less than 800 uh, egregious safety violations in your drilling, you got no business drilling on American soil or over American waters. Yet they were allowed to drill when during comparable times, Exxon, others had one, two, none. They had about 800. It appears that the reason they were allowed to keep going, even though there was such a great un, uh, lack of safety, um, it looks like it must have been because they were about to say they uh, come out publicly as a big energy company that embraced the president's cap-and-trade bill. And that was going to be big news, so they didn't want to alienate a big energy company. Of course, they were going to be uh, getting uh, even richer dealing in the carbon credits, uh, consistent with the crony capitalism. They were going to be thrown lots of uh, bonuses through that. But anyway, this ought to be an exciting time in American history. We have energy galore. Man from China told me that he thought they had figured out what we were doing for our energy policy. We kept declaring all our energy off limits, more and more of it. We wouldn't use the energy we've got. We may have more, or we do have more energy when you consider all the resources than any other country in the world. While the president's busy out there deriding America for using too much energy, we make the world safer, we make the world more peaceable, we make the environment cleaner. When manufacturers leave America and go to other places in the world, they, they pollute four to 10 times more in most of the places that those manufacturers are going to you really care about the, the environment, would well, keep them here. Many of them are union jobs. You'd think the unions would embrace what we're trying to do rather than what the president's doing. But I understand loyalty runs deep. We've got health care that has been rammed down the throats of Americans. Majority didn't want it. The elections revealed that in November 2010. All of the polls revealed that throughout 2009 and 2010. We got it forced upon us. When really, what this government does best is play referee. Make sure everybody is playing fair and playing by the rules. Because the problem is, when we become a player, we become a coach, and the referee, we're terrible at all three. When we get so involved in owning part of Wall Street 
that we're not watching what's going on. You have things like Madoff ripping people off right and left. We should be the referees, making sure everybody plays fairly. Not the players, not the coaches, but the referees. Government, federal government especially, is a terrible coach trying to tell people how to make a business work. The best thing that could happen is if we get insurance companies out of the health care management business that they're in now, they're really not in the insurance business anymore, they're in the health management business, and if we don't get them back into the insurance business and out of them managing our lives and our health, then they'll be out of business and the government will take over it all just as Obamacare anticipates. That's where it's all headed. If we don't get the federal government out of being a player and coach and referee in health care, then the government will ultimately be the only player and coach and referee. And that does not bode well for Americans. We have a chance now for the first time since the 60s, since Medicare was thought up, to allow our seniors to take control of their own health care and give them the resources to do it. We should have, there would be nothing like a real test. Medicare here, you want Medicare, have it. Just the way it is. Or we'll buy you a health care private insurance policy that will be referees and make sure they play fair. And we'll make it a high deductible policy because those are so much cheaper. And then we'll give you cash in a health savings account there will be enough to cover the amount of your deductible each year. And in the end, it will be cheaper. And it will give people the dignity and patients the control of their health care. So they don't have to beg the federal government. They don't have to beg this board that the Obamacare has set up. They don't have to beg some insurance company. Please, please let me have this treatment. You'll have insurance. You'll have the money to cover the high deductible, and we move people into being in charge of their own lives. Because the, only, the alternative is rather grim. But let's be clear. This government wants to control people's lives, and as soon as Obamacare were to be fully operational, then the federal government has every right to tell people what they can eat, tell people what medicines they can have, tell people when they won't get that pacemaker, as the president told the uh, lady at the White House during the town hall. Maybe, uh, maybe it's time we tell people like your mom, who had 10 extra years of life because of a pacemaker, maybe it's time to tell your mom you don't get the pacemaker, you just, just take a pain pill. If we don't get this turned around, the government will have every right to tell you what to eat, what to drink, how much you have to exercise, what you can and can't do. Our freedoms will be gone. I've got a great quote here from one of the founders. A man named Thomas Jefferson. Nope. Oh. If people let the government decide what foods they eat and what medicines they take, their bodies will soon be in as sorry a state as are the souls of those who live under tyranny. Thomas Jefferson. Those that say, gee, I want to have unlimited sex and I want the government to pay for it. Somebody's got to. I want the government controlling my life. People that that feel like they need the government telling them what to do, wherever it is, whatever aspect of life. Sam Adams is given credit as being one of the most influential founders in giving us this great nation. Sam Adams, if you love, if you love wealth better than liberty, the tranquility of servitude, than the animating contest of freedom, go from us in peace. We ask not your counsels or your arms. Crouch down and lick the hands which feed you. May your chains sit lightly upon you. And may posterity forget that you were ever our countrymen. San Adams. 
Now, once the government has the right to control everybody's health care, it will have the right to tell you what freedoms it will recognize and you can practice and which you can't. That's why one of the reasons Obamacare is so objectionable it's the, in govern the government intrusion into so many areas of our lives. The First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or the press, or the right of the people peaceable to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. We're not supposed to make a law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. Obamacare does that. It gives this government the power to say, you know what? People ought to be able to get abortions paid for by the government, which means the taxpayers pay for it. They ought to be able to get... Um, contraceptives as they wish. So never mind the fact that right now if there's somebody in America that needs contraceptives, they can be obtained, plenty of sources. Still, the president feels the need to intrude upon religious beliefs and say, folks, you can't practice this belief. You believe abortion is murder. It's murder of an unborn child. Well, tell you what we'll do. We'll just say your money doesn't go for abortions. Yet in Obamacare, it's very clear there will be clinics, there will be policies that will provide abortions, and people that pay into policies, those policies insure across the board, and they will cover that, and money is fungible. It will be used for abortions. It will be used for con uh, uh, for contraceptives, even though there are people putting in money to the system that object and feel they are violating their religious beliefs. So it struck me that the president recently found time to apologize to someone who had been up here on the Hill testifying, but he never found time to apologize to those who he told you cannot practice your religious beliefs. Oh, yeah, he tried to make an accommodation for a church and a hospital, but Catholics that have these closely held beliefs, I'm a Baptist, but good grief, if you're going to tell a Catholic they can't practice their religion, because as some in this body have said, a majority think you shouldn't, you're going to tell people they can't practice their religious beliefs? For heaven's sake, at least giving them an apology, but not so. No apology there. So I thought, well, maybe it'd be helpful to track exactly what deserves apology and what doesn't. Well, we remember when the president first came into office, first thing he did was take what a lot of people refer to as apology tour. He went around the world apologizing for America's arrogance toward countries where we had Americans buried who gave their last full measure of devotion to free those countries. But the president found time. Did they get an apology or no apology? Yep, got an apology. All right. There were Bush policies that our president said toward countries that we actually give tremendous amount of money to, but who vote against us over half the time in the U.N., do they get an apology? Bingo. He found time to give them an apology. The family of Border Patrol agent Brian Terry, murdered by Operation Fast and Furious gun that our government forced to be sold to criminals. Well, no time for an apology. They don't get one. The CIA enhanced interrogation that saved lives and led to finding Osama bin Laden. We do have time to apologize for that. There you go. All right.
detaining terrorists who killed or conspired to kill Americans at Guantanamo, even though there's not been a single incident of waterboarding or torture of any kind remotely at Guantanamo, although when you th they throw feces or urine on our guards, we will take away two hours of their movie watching. Still, they get an apology from this White House. The accidental 2012 burning of, the, of these Qurans that were desecrated by the writing of, of detainees, yes, they got an apology. The families of the American soldiers who were killed after President Obama said he, quote, calmed things down by apologizing to Afghanistan. Nope, didn't get an apology. No apology there. Our own soldiers, but nope, no apology. Death of two Pakistani soldiers in Pakistan and the injuries of four other Pakistanis in 2010 when a plane, um, we're told, made a mistake. Yep, Pakistanis. They get apology, but Americans don't. Pakistanis do. The president's support for the Ground Zero Mosque at 2010 White House Iftar dinner, opposed by most Americans, including 9-11 survivors. Most Americans didn't want a mosque at Ground Zero. The president said it was a matter of religious freedom. So basically, the word apology I don't believe was used, but it was an apology. We believe in them being allowed to do that, even though it offends most Americans and Victims' families. Yep. Yep. They're at the White. They were at the White House, hearing how sorry he was that Americans opposed that. Comments in 2011 that Israel should return to its 1967 borders that would have subjected it to relentless attacks and vulnerability, as Prime Minister Netanyahu explained. No, nope, Israel doesn't get one. No apology for Israel. His good friends Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn, the first people to have a fundraiser at the House for him. They were part of a radical left-wing group, Weather Underground, detonated a bomb at the Pentagon in 1972. And we know there are people still serving the military that were around when the Pentagon was attacked by his biggest, earliest supporters. They don't get an apology. No apology. Ordering many Christians to violate their religious beliefs and pay for abortion, drugs, and contraceptives. Nope, no apology there. Violates your religious beliefs. Too bad, no apology. Comments by President Obama and President Sarkozy in 2011 at the G20 summit where they belittled Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu. He's Israeli. No apology for that. Comments made by Rush Limbaugh in his radio program about pro-abortion activists and Georgetown Law student Sandra, and I'm told it's flock, fluke, whatever. Uh, yes, President found time for that apology. Uh, President's support for not allowing nurses to save babies that were born alive after a botched abortion. We've heard from some of those at least one of those nurses, how brokenhearted they were sitting there having to be forced to watch a baby die. No apology for those folks. Attendance for 20 years at Trinity United Church of Christ where radical pastor Reverend Jeremiah Wright used racial and anti-Semitic terms, inflammatory rhetoric and insulting comments about Hillary Clinton from his pastor. Uh, I believe the comment was he could no more disown that fine gentleman, which he later did. No apology for anybody offended by that. And inflammatory and indecent comments of one of President Obama's biggest supporters, Bill Maher, regarding Sarah Palin and Michelle Bachman, tens of times worse than anything Rush Limbaugh would have ever dreamed of saying. Um, that's right, no apology for them. So I think it helps to chronicle exactly what deserves an apology from the White House these days. You know, just so we know where policies lie. 
and where this president stands and with whom he stands. And with that, Madam Speaker, I would um, yield back my time so that my friend Mr. Burton could finish. Gentleman yields back his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Indiana I, rise? I, I'd like to uh, use a few minutes of his remaining time if it's possible. The gentleman seeking a one minute request. One uh, more. I, I'm not sure what the procedure is on the half hours. The gentleman from Texas had one minute remaining. Oh, okay. Well, then I'll uh, wait for my colleague from Texas to start. She's going to yield me a couple of minutes, I think. Thank you. Will the gentle lady yield? I'll, I'll under. Okay. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, for 30 minutes. I thank the Speaker. I'll be happy at this time to yield a few minutes uh, to the distinguished gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton. I, I thank my colleague from Texas, and I'd like to say that she's a pleasure to travel with. She's a real gentle lady. Uh, the reason I take the floor uh, for just a couple of minutes is uh, uh, one of our dearest friends in the Capitol is a fellow named Joe Quattroni. He is uh, a barber down in the house barber shop, and he on uh, March the 1st, he celebrated 42 years cutting hair in the capital of the United States. He came to the United States when he was 18 years old from Italy. He said he has lived the American dream, and he's one of the nicest people that I think you'll ever meet. Everybody that's ever worked with him or had their hair cut by Joe really understands that he's a very caring person and one that they respect. He has cut the hair of every Speaker of the House except two. <laughs> Nancy Pelosi, and I don't think she goes to the men's barbershop, and John Boehner, the current Speaker. And I'm going to talk to, to uh, Speaker Boehner as soon as we get back from break and get him down so Joe can say he cut every Speaker's hair since he's been uh, a barber down there. He has cut the hair of Vice Presidents, Presidents, the President of Italy, Secretary of Transportation, Ambassadors, Governors, Admirals, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, but his favorite person, besides me, is Tip O'Neill, the Speaker of the House, when Tip was the Speaker some time back. And uh, uh, he has also worked, before he came here, at the Air Force Base at Andrews and the Pentagon. But I'd just like to say to Joe the Barber, because we're going to give him a copy of this floor statement, uh, Madam Speaker, that he has been a credit to the institution of Congress. He's liked by everybody that's ever had him been in his chair. And uh, I just want to congratulate him on 42 years of working here in the Capitol. And I don't think anybody's ever complained about him. He's really a nice guy. He started March the 1st, 1970, and he's here now 42, 42 years later. And I just say, Joe, congratulations. I'll be down to see you in two weeks. I yield back the balance of my time. Yields back. I was very happy to yield to the gentleman and thank you. And I indicated to you in the spirit of bipartisanship, although I've not had the privilege of having Joe cut my hair, uh, let me congratulate Joe the Barber because he is uh, the epitome of a public servant. He has worked for this August institution for 42 years, and I'm very proud to say that he can claim that he has uh, done the hair or cut the hair of all of our speakers. And I don't think our speaker, who has uh, outstanding Italian heritage, our former speaker, uh, Speaker Pelosi, would in any way shy away from congratulating uh, this distinguished gentleman who came to this country and literally is a walking, uh, if you will, um, uh, American dream. And so I want to congratulate you, Joe the Barber, on behalf of a bipartisan Congress, uh, and join my colleague, uh, Mr. Burton, congratulating you for your service. You are truly a public servant to all of your family members, and we wish you long life. Again, congratulations for 42 years to Joe the Barber. Uh, with that, uh, I will continue my remarks uh, and uh, thank the speaker uh, for... Will the gentlewoman suspend? Members are reminded to address their remarks to the chair. Gentlewoman may proceed. Thank you, Madam uh, 
speaker, and we look forward to addressing these very important issues uh, to you, and, and certainly um, we want to make sure that we address questions. In the coming weeks, uh, we will be discussing uh, the attributes of the Affordable Care Act, and I will look forward to coming to the floor of the House again and acknowledging how much money uh, the Affordable Care Act, the Health Care Act, uh, has in fact uh, saved this nation, how it has preserved Medicare, how we focus on medical education, medical school education, uh, medical providers education, uh, how we have talked about issues dealing with health care disparities, um, and uh, in particular, uh, how we have expanded the community health clinics that have saved lives, uh, how we have worked on issues dealing with children's health care, uh, how we have provided access to health care for many, many people. That allows me or calls upon me to again follow up, uh, to again distinguish uh, the Georgetown Law student uh, who spoke before members of Congress who got in the crosshairs of a uh, commentary uh, that was not very flattering. I just want to distinguish uh, the commentary that came against the Georgetown Law student from comments that would be made by entertainers and uh, others uh, across the nation in the course of their comedic work. Uh, the question about the Georgetown Law student was, uh, Madam Speaker, is that she was called before members of Congress to speak. She was not speaking on a uh, television program or on an interview. She was actually called by members of Congress to testify to the question of access of health care to women. And I will tell you that right now uh, documentation shows that women uh, who are 24 years old and above, uh, their health plans today cost 84 percent cost, 84 percent more than a male similarly situated. So we know that without health insurance, how devastating it would be for women not to have health insurance. Many of the Planned Parenthood family clinics and others are focused on health care. We, we want to have a firewall as Planned Parenthood, Planned Parenthood, Parenthood has, and that is uh, that the firewall is that access to health care is a distinguishable factor of their service. And that's what this uh, young woman was speaking about, the importance of access to health care. It was in the course of that testimony that made her uh, a victim of public ridicule. That's why I believe President Obama appropriately acknowledged the right of a citizen to petition his or her government and that if they do so, that they should not be subject uh, to public ridicule. There lies the basis of the President of the United States uh, calling uh, this Georgetown Law School student. And I applaud that because no matter how high you are, the highest office in the land, the Commander in Chief, isn't it appropriate or isn't it befitting of an individual who represents all of the people of the United States to have the humanity to be able to call people uh, citizens, families, when they're at their lowest ebb, when they've been in the course of public service or they have been in a position of presenting their public case to the United States Congress or even to the President of the United States of America. I hope that we, no matter what our position and station in life, particularly those of us who hold roles in the most powerful lawmaking body of the world, the United States Congress, the highest office is considered the commander and uh, in chief and also the leader of the free world, that we would have the capacity uh, to offer an apology to someone who has felt offended. I want to move into an apology that I want to offer, and that is to the families in my district uh, whose loved ones have been buried uh, in our Veterans Cemetery in Houston off of Veterans Memorial, who have now faced this tragic circumstance of having headstones misplaced or moved. I don't think there should be any tolerance for that. I believe that uh, when an individual takes an oath to serve in the United States military, for those who, uh, through God's grace, are able to return from battlefields, who are able to retire out of the military as veterans, that we owe them uh, a great deal of respect uh, for their benefits. And then to those families who experience a fallen loved one either in battle 
All that they ultimately uh, die as a veteran of the United States military should expect that the sacredness of their burial be respected. And I will be visiting our cemetery in Houston, Texas, and asking, can we not get it right? Can we not fix the problem that moves headstones, that has misplaced headstones, mislabeled headstones? I frankly believe uh, that our men and women in the United States military deserve better, and I'm going to ask for better and insist on that. I have been working uh, over the last uh, couple of uh, uh, weeks uh, meeting uh, with uh, a very prominent Syrian American in my district, uh, having met uh, with him and others uh, in uh, months past on this whole question of Syria. Uh, just last week I presented uh, a letter to the uh, representative of the Syrian embassy demanding for uh, President Assad uh, to resign and step down from office, demanding that the Red Cross be allowed uh, at that time to come in and provide humanitarian relief, demanding that women and children be protected and taken to safe places so that they could receive health care and food, and at that time asking for the respectful removal of the deceased, uh, the bodies of the two fallen Western uh, reporters, and as well uh, with uh, the uh, others that had been wounded. Uh, some progress has been made uh, in the immediate uh, hours of that visit, we saw that the Red Cross and the Red Crescent were able to come in, or the International Red Cross facilities. Then shortly thereafter, we saw that, saw that Syrian forces were bombing uh, the humanitarian relief efforts, uh, and we heard an interview from one of the Western reporters to clearly indicate uh, that the two reporters that died were actually murdered because the Syrian forces actually targeted the location where they were, where journalists were, where everyone knows that there is an effort to maintain a firewall or respect for journalists no matter where they are on a battlefield or in the area, if known where they are allegedly trying to be in a safe place, and then you directly bomb that area, uh, then uh, you know that there is certainly basis for someone, a interview that took place on CNN that indicated that they thought it was direct murder. But whatever we, however we define it, we know that there is enormous loss of life. I want uh, to just say that having had the privilege of serving on the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, now a ranking member on a subcommittee on Homeland Security, having served on that committee for a number uh, of years uh, since 9-11, uh, the tragedy of 9-11, uh, having gone to a number of war zones from uh, Bosnia to Kosovo, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, uh, having gone to Mumbai uh, right after the uh, horrific terrorist bombing, uh, and knowing uh, what uh, conflicts around the world uh, mean in terms of either sending out military personnel or even after we engage. Uh, if you look at the NATO engagement, which included the United States or Libya, there are many who will say right now, look at the confusion. But I think it's important to understand that the intent of the NATO allies was to stop the brutality. Uh, the, the aftermath, we would want it to be better. We would want there to be not the conflictedness that is going on, uh, the tribal conflictedness, uh, the instability of the Libyan government as we speak. To be very truthful with you, of course we don't want that to be happening. But no one uh, took to the NATO alliance or took to the air to bomb Libya in agreement, in a coalition, to create confusion afterward. The, re the call and the response was to stop what was apparent of the slaughter and the killing of Libyan citizens en masse. We know it is not perfect now. Iraq is not perfect, frankly, and we made it worse by going in uh, to Iraq because at that time uh, there was not that kind of immediate conflict. But that was the basis for uh, Libya. Now we have a situation where the argument is that Syria, it's too complicated. Uh, and in the region that it's in, the impact of a direct hit is too complicated. But today I am calling upon the very body that was established in the late 1940s, after the very end of the 1940s, after we ended uh, World War II, another horrific and heinous world conflict 
upon which we did not expect based upon historical perspectives when uh, many argue that World War I was a war to end all wars and of course that did not happen and we've had conflicts and wars since. But right now the brutality of violence against the Syrian people, uh, the, the desperation of killing children in the street, of slaughtering babies, of not allowing the wounded to get health care, calls upon the world to respond. And I think it is very clear uh, that it is complex enough uh, that a direct attack by the United States, as the administration has acknowledged, would not be appropriate. A direct attack, a direct hit by the United States may not get the results that we would like. But there is no doubt that we cannot leave uh, in good conscience uh, this Congress without someone calling for an immediate response and relief from the United Nations, which was organized to draw together world support. Whether it is appropriate for UN peacekeepers, whether it is appropriate for uh, the UN working with some of the Arab states out of the Arab League, it is absolutely ludicrous and tragic and disastrous and heinous for us to watch night after night of the violence that is going on against the Syrian people. Uh, one may argue that there's violence everywhere, but it is a call upon our humanitarian position in the world to be able to call out for assistance. So today, uh, I am calling for actions by the United Nations uh, in uh, establishing or reaching out for a coalition that would provide military re response. What does that mean? providing weapons, if you will, so that uh, those individuals who are defending themselves against slaughter, let's be very clear, these individuals are trying to defend themselves against slaughter, one city after another, direct attacks by the Syrian national forces, ordered by President Assad, who refuses to leave, and no one has been able to make him leave, and the violence and the bloodshed continues on and on and on and on. So I don't think uh, that we can stand and do nothing. And I've already indicated I fully understand that a direct hit by the United States would not be uh, the appropriate direction to take. But that does not leave us helpless. Uh, and it does not leave the United Nations helpless. And as a member of Congress that has supported the United Nations over and over again for the value of its presence in terms of a world force, to insist upon some coming together of nations to the Secretary General, don't shame yourself with inaction. Don't shame the United Nations with inaction by not calling upon those who have resources in the region to be able to provide those rebels or those who are defending themselves or those men and young boys that are defending themselves that are picking up sticks and whatever they are using from being slaughtered in the streets, from having amputated legs, from having no ability uh, to be able to attend to the wounded. Today, March 8th, it is imperative that you begin to assess the violent situation and you stop this slaughter now. As we leave to work in the districts, I will be pushing back on this issue, continuing to push back to the United Nations, asking the Arab League for their help through different states to provide this care. How do I put a backdrop on this? Uh, this happens to be the week of which we commemorate what we called in this nation Bloody Sunday. For many who don't understand that day, it was yesterday, and it was the day that uh, those individuals who were pleading for the right to vote uh, in this country, similar to uh, the concept of democracy and freedom in a different way, in a different era. The Syrians are saying that they are oppressed by this regime. But in the day that we were in the midst of civil rights, there were regions and places and people that could not vote in this country. And so citizens from all backgrounds took to Selma, Alabama and proceeded nonviolently after being violently pushed back uh, and in essence bloodied came back and walked peacefully over that uh, bridge in Selma, Alabama, which was commemorated last Sunday, but the actual date was this uh, Wednesday. I will be commemorating it in Houston, Texas on this Sunday, March 11th. But the concept simply was when people felt uh, that they were oppressed, that in this nation they found a way to find relief through a nonviolent approach 
ultimately, as those who are historians will know, we passed in a bipartisan way with the signature of President Lyndon Baines Johnson, both the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which I maintain today is a protector of every citizen's right to vote, no matter what your racial background, where you live. The Voting Rights Act simply says one person, one vote. We protect you. We protect America. We believe in voting, and we have since tried to expand that to ensure that there are election laws that don't stop people, oppress people from voting, and any number of things like voter IDs when there are no fraud, where people have a registration card and have lived in the community, we should be allowing citizens to vote. But I put that in the context because now this is 2012 and I think Americans feel with some, um, um, if you will, how should I call it, uh, some mishaps and laws that uh, probably don't work, that we can vote. Well, just think of a society that feels that they can speak, uh, that they cannot um, uh, act upon a free government. Just think of that kind of society. And then you want to petition your government, and what happens? What happens? You're slaughtered. You're slaughtered. There's no peaceable marching, because if you studied Syria, you will know that they started peaceably marching. And what happened? The Syrian forces came and attacked them with weaponry and with violence. They killed them, plain and simple, when they were marching for freedom. And so I would ask that we, again, uh, not allow this to happen. Uh, and I will proceed uh, with my uh, petitioning to the United Nations, and I will be prayerful as well. Because as we stand here today, I will assure you that there are those in Syria that are dying as I am on this floor today, that there are those that are losing their lives, that they are being attacked by the Syrian national forces or killing people uh, in the street. I don't think that we can allow that to occur anymore in this month of which we celebrate uh, Women's History Month and uh, the fact that we've celebrated some of the women peacemakers right now today. Women are being wounded, uh, women are being hurt, their children are being hurt uh, in Syria. I want to thank uh, uh, the speaker for uh, yielding uh, this time and allowing me to call upon the good graces of the international family uh, to be able to lift up the souls and the spirits and the lives of the Syrian people. Uh, and as you reflect on this, let me just say, when you thought there was no hope, uh, and you can look at the Arab Spring, although governments are not perfect, and we are struggling for these governments such as Egypt and others uh, to establish themselves, who would have ever thought uh, that uh, individuals could have brought about a change in Egypt and Tunisia and, uh, and uh, uh, Libya? Who would have ever thought uh, that democracy would uh, be raising its head as difficult as it is don't give up on the Syrian people. Don't give up on those children, those babies, those young men, those men and those families. Don't give up on Syria and don't stand by idly while bloodshed continues and Syrians are slaughtered in the street. I look forward to a final relief and the lifting of our humanitarian spirit uh, as we as a nation uh, celebrate um, the democracy and the freedom in which we are able to live. I yield back. Gentility yields back. Chair lays before the House of Communication. The Honorable the Speaker, House of Representatives, sir, this is to notify you formally, pursuant to Rule 8 of the Rules of the House of Representatives, that I have been served with a subpoena issued by the Las Vegas Justice Court for witness testimony. After consultation with the Office of General Counsel, I have determined that compliance with the subpoena is consistent with the privileges and rights of the House. Signed sincerely, Jan Churchill, District Representative. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Texas rise? Madam Speaker, mm -hmm. I now move that the House now adjourn. The question is on the motion to adjourn. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. Accordingly, the House stands adjourned until 11 a.m. tomorrow. So the House has gaveled out, but earlier today, members passed a bill that reduces regulations for companies going public. The vote, 390 to 23. The chamber is out of session next week for a district work period, but members return for legislative work on Monday, March 19th. 